Welcome, everybody. We are live from California for today's webinar with Inscripta. Inscripta is uh, based out of Boulder, Colorado, and uh, has other offices here in the Bay Area and in San Diego. And we're going to be joined today by Andrew Gast, who is the principal scientist and founder of Inscripta. We're just going to wait a few minutes for people to continue joining before uh, I bring in Andrew to talk about precision editing for genome scale evolution. That's the topic and we're going to be looking underneath the hood uh, for something that many of us have been waiting for because Inscripta has been around now for a few years and uh, is about to make a very big splash at Symbiobeta in October. Kevin Ness is going to be giving the welcome keynote and he's also the presenting sponsor of Symbi Beta 2019, which is going to be at SBN West in San Francisco, October 1 through 3. Many of you have already bought your tickets to come join us. And uh, the most important thing that the presenting sponsor gets to do is uh, throw the big welcome launch party at the end of day one, which is on Monday, uh, sorry, Tuesday, October 1st. So I'm very excited uh, to, be, uh, to be working with Inscripta. I'm John Cumbers and I'm the CEO and the founder of Synbio Beta, where tech meets bio and bio meets tech. And our webinar series features conversations with synthetic biology's leading thinkers and doers on building a better world with biology. Now today is going to be an interactive webinar. And uh, if you look at the bottom, you will see a Q&A box and you can type in your questions into that box and Andrew or I will be able to answer them in real time. Um, we're going to talk about the challenges of genome engineering today. We're going to be looking at the tools and technologies that Inscriptor is using to overcome them. And we're going to be talking about Andrew's vision for digital genome engineering in the years to come. And we are recording this webinar, so uh, you'll be able to watch it um, later on. And we also welcome any, uh, any feedback on the format. You can either send it to us via email um, or again, you can put it in the Q&A in the comments section. So with that, I'm going to dive in and welcome Andrew. Um, Andrew's interests reside in the study of RNA biology and the development of RNA-based tools that can be leveraged for applications in biotechnology and medicine. He's particularly interested in building forward engineering solutions that enable rapid design and characterization of living systems for basic and translational research by combining user-friendly software, automation, and robust biological performance. He enjoys working in cross-disciplinary teams that value creativity and innovation and favor empirical problem-solving approaches over expert dogmatism. Andrew has a PhD in biochemistry from uh, CU Boulder, and he is the principal scientist at Inscripta who's developed uh, all of the core chemistry that you're going to hear about in this uh, pretty amazing piece of machinery. Welcome, Andrew. Thanks, John. Um, pleasure. Yeah, pleasure to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is great. So we're going, to, uh, we're going to dive into a presentation that you've got for us shortly, but uh, I wanted just to ask a couple of background questions. Can you tell me a little bit about how you came to co-found Inscripta? Yeah, so I was working as a postdoc at CU, and uh, the, the stated goal of my research there was to try to develop uh, <clears throat> uh, genome-scaled e editing tools uh, explicitly with the goal of being able to track edits at population scale. So... Um, when I joined the Gill Lab, they were pretty immersed. This was the Gill, uh, Ryan Gill at CU Boulder. Um, they were uh, already immersed in, in um, the genome editing world. Um, so they, they had developed a couple of genome-wide technologies that were non-nuclease based. Uh, and my uh, research uh, goals were to bring on the, the nuclease based engineering systems in that lab. Um, so, Oh, that, sorry, we're having video issues trying to turn off the video. So the, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so um, I, I spent the first uh, year bringing on CRISPR into Ryan's lab, and then we, we spent another couple years really working on trying to scale CRISPR to do the kinds of genome-wide applications that uh, we were interested in for more for the directed evolution uh, side of things, um, because when we inherited CRISPR, it was really a one site-at-a-time technology. 
Um, the, that work translated into what, what I'll talk about today as the CREATE technology, um, which we published in Nature Biotech. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, from there, um, Ryan and uh, our other co-founder, Tanya, uh, they, they did a good job of uh, pitching this to uh, uh, investment teams that we eventually raised funding and, and started the whole Inscript uh, mission to really democratize all of this for uh, the broader research community. So. And what you're going to be launching at the conference in October is a one-stop shop uh, piece of hardware that's going to sit on the lab bench of, uh, of many labs around the world. And uh, the, the big deal is the scale of what you can do with this machine that you can't do elsewhere. Is that right? That's right. So yeah, rather than uh, a large foundry setup where you'd have lots of, uh, you know, automation and moving uh, a lot of moving parts to move, you know, sample wells around, what we're building is sort of a one-stop shop, as you said, uh, where everything's self-contained on a single instrument and you can deliver tens of thousands to even hundreds of thousands of edits, uh, edited cell libraries um, at a time. So that that's really the, the scale and scope of what we're trying to provide for our customers. Got it. And um, CRISPR can theoretically let us remix entire genomes, but instead of true forward cell engineering, we're still, we still seem to be tinkering with one gene here and, and one gene there. What, why, what's been holding us back so far? Well, I think that uh, when, we, when we started in CRISPR, there was, there was some dogmatism about the workflows that you needed to do. Um, there was a lot of prior uh, art on using single-stranded oligos as the donors. Um, and I think people you know, really bought into that's how you had to do genome edit editing to get high efficiency. So there was, I think, the efficiency debate uh, dominated for some time. Uh, and, and we sort of re reimagined the way in which you could put all the parts together and deliver both the donor and uh, guide pieces uh, to be able to get a, a scalable system. Because we were really, you know, stuck at, we could do this uh, for, you know, a, a single locus. Uh, we could do many edits in a single locus, but we were, really couldn't scale it beyond that until we uh, adopted the create approach. Got it. Um, and uh, so we're going to go into the create uh, biochemistry and the nature biotech paper that you published on it. Um, help us understand um, for everybody listening, what the difference is between forward engineering and reverse engineering. Yeah. So we, we see forward engineering as a, a pre-programmed set of questions that you can, uh, you know, state uh, to your biological system. Uh, you know, so there's there's design inquiry that, that goes into the upfront part, um, and that's really um, sort of a massively parallel hypothesis testing machine um, versus reverse engineering, where you're you're sort of seeing interesting traits or phenotypes uh, pop out of some you know uh, traditionally like adaptive laboratory evolution or or other uh, you know um, uh, diversity generation process and then backing out which mutations you made, we're providing a way to sort of uh, close that cycle and do it in a forward engineering process. Great, excellent. So we're gonna dive into your presentation shortly. Final question is um, thinking about the microbial hosts um, that the platform is compatible with. Is it just E. coli or what's the range of organisms that you can put into this machine? So yeah, at first customer ship, it will be a E. coli and uh, Saccharomyces uh, cerevisiae. Um, there are plans to expand that. So both in the number of different strains, there are different uh, strains of E. coli and uh, cerevisiae. But then beyond those two, um, there are plans to develop uh, a mammalian platform, a mammalian cell platform. It'll be select lines that, we, that we're uh, going to provide that for. And that I think we're looking at 2020 for uh, uh, launch on that. Got it. Okay, fantastic. Um, so I just want to do a technical check to make sure that we're recording uh, this because it says recording paused on my screen. So just want to check that it's working before we dive into the slides. Um, it's looking like everything's good. So Andrew, if you want to uh, bring up the slides, uh, we will we will dive right in. All righty. And while Andrew's doing that, I just want to remind people this is live. So if you have questions during the talk, uh, no matter of their nature, if it's a dumb question, we like those. If it's a technical question, we like those too. So just post them in the box and, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll take them as they come in. Okay, so over to you, Andrew. 
All right, great. Yeah, so to, so to tell the Inscripta story, I thought it would uh, actually be good to kind of put some context around um, where we entered uh, the larger directed evolution uh, tools uh, um, scheme. So uh, I'm going to break this talk into three sections where I first uh, introduce CRISPR and uh, the, the um, directed evolution tool space. Then I'm going to talk about the uh, create technology that we launched uh, Inscripta with. Uh, and finally, I'm going to talk about uh, Inscripta's goals of democratizing genome engineering for the broader community. Um, so for the uh, introduction to CRISPR, what I like to do here is, uh, you know, break it into both the non-nuclease and nuclease-based technology. So on the top, you have the non-nuclease technologies and some of the, the uh, achievements people have reached using non-nuclease-based engineering. Um, so, you know, this, this sort of engineering spans all the way back to uh, the uh, advent of agriculture. Um, people were employing, uh, at the time they didn't know the mechanism, but they were employing recombination uh, to, to be able to do selective breeding and, and trait selection for different animals and crops. Um, it wasn't until 19, or 1859 that Charles Darwin started to put some framework on what the selective units were and help us understand the mutability of organisms. Um, and then by 1914, people actually started to do some of their first experiments in a laboratory setting uh, where they employed chemical mutagenesis. Um, and, and we also started to inherit our first uh, concepts of a fitness landscape from Seawall Wright in 1932. So that was all before we even really took uh, direct evolution into the lab. And it wasn't until the 1960s that we really started to see um, laboratory examples of directed evolution, uh, starting with some of the uh, RNA evolution experiments that uh, Saul Spiegelman uh, uh, demonstrated where an RNA could evolve, self evolve uh, for replicative purposes. Um, you then saw uh, through the advances in oligosynthesis, uh, uh, Smith showed uh, that you could do site directed mutagenesis. So, oligo mediated mutagenesis started to come, come online there. Um, and <clears throat> fast forward to 1980, uh, we started to understand how to deliver DNA into the nucleus. Uh, this came out of Mario Capesci's uh, work, uh, which he received the Nobel Prize for uh, the, the nuclear delivery of DNA, showing how transgene expression could work. Uh, 1982, we started to uh, understand um, how to do some directed evolution using phage display. So this is starting to, you know, look more like what we, we uh, think about in today's world of, of high throughput directed evolution, where you can create massive library of uh, protein variants display them on a phage and then select for the best binders and activities and run that in a recursive mode. Um, <clears throat> by 1987, uh, site-directed mutagenesis uh, was shown to be a, a, a first demonstration that you could do that in mouse embryos, again from Mario Capesci, uh, really started to open people's minds to, hey, like we can, we can directly impose, you know, new code into living systems and test uh, the phenotypic outcomes. Um, and then in the 1990s, we saw the, the uh, generation of a, a number of different new tools to speed up this evolutionary process. So starting in 1993, uh, Francis Arnold uh, started to employ an error-prone PCR process that could speed up the mutation rates uh, as you amplify uh, different genes uh, for uh, uh, diversity generation. Um, and she uh, as you see down there at the end, 2018, on the right side here, um, let's see if we can, can you see the mouse? She later won, the, she just recently won the Nobel Prize for the accumulation of, of that work um, among the many others listed here. Um, uh, Pim Stemmer uh, also brought online DNA shuffling, where again, this process is actually like what was used in, in the uh, selective breeding back here in the, uh, ancient times, except for that now it was uh, done in the lab at, at a, a very high rate using uh, enzymatic uh, principles uh, to, to speed up the rate of recombination between uh, beneficial variants. So he showed this first at the single protein and later at the pathway and genome scales over the course of about a decade. 
Um, you also started to see uh, uh, microarrays make their way into the, the um, genome editing world. So people started to understand how to use uh, barcoding principles to make gene knockouts, uh, genome-wide knockout libraries in yeast um, out of uh, Ron Davis's lab at, at uh, Stanford. Um, and, and you also started to see uh, in the early 2000s uh, structure guided approaches where uh, people were, um, you know, basically able to predict where you'd have the biggest impacts on, on a protein function and guide the, the directed evolution search um, because you have such a large search base uh, with which to operate in for any directed evolution problem. Um, 2003, uh, you started to see some machine learning meets uh, directed evolution uh, with things like the ProSAR algorithm. This uh, was, was published by Richard Fox, one of my esteemed colleagues here at Inscripta, uh, when he was at Maxigen. And that really started to um, hyper-accelerate some of the things people could do in the industrial setting in terms of, uh, you know, uh, beneficial traits being selected on rapid timescales. Um, this uh, sort of work led to some of the directed evolution for uh, enzymes like a transaminase that could make st uh, stigoliptin uh, that came out of Codexis. This is a multi-billion dollar a year drug that was developed using uh, directed evolution principles. So you started to see uh, directed evolution having an impact in the in the marketplace uh, from the from directly from the, the uh, sped up lab processes. Um, there's also tools like uh, multiplex automated genome engineering out of the church lab that uh, started to get people thinking more on how do we hyper-accelerate this in rational ways at the genome level. Um, and, and then, of course, there's some recent work that's been done out of uh, both Jeff Buka's lab and at SGI with Dan Gibson, where uh, uh, whole genomes have been assembled uh, from uh, starting the starting point of synthetic oligos up to the whole genome scale. So a lot of interesting things were happening in the non-nuclease world uh, and overlapping with what was happening in the nuclease world. But I like to show this because uh, some of what these guys were employing, like in studies here in the 2006 uh, Stigoliptin uh, story, were very high throughput in their ability to generate diversity. Meanwhile, the, the nuclease editing technologies were still lagging way behind. So with the nuclease-based technologies, um, you know, the story is a little different. If we, if we shift down to the bottom here, you had uh, 1972, Paul Berg uh, discovered restriction enzymes and people started to use those for cloning purposes. Uh, but it was as early as 1988 that people realized that uh, with the homing endonuclease, the whole nuclease, um, you could you could create uh, high levels of recombination uh, through a double strand break uh, within the within the chromosome. So by the 1980s, we already started to have some idea that hey, if we can figure out how to do this better and at more sites, um, you know, we have a tool here to modify genomes directly. Um, in 1992, people also uh, started to see that with uh, another mega nuclease, the uh, SKI-1 nuclease. Uh, these, these studies were both done in yeast. Uh, and then uh, it was 1993 where we first started to get hints that there was something interesting uh, in these CRISPR loci, and they were being found in multiple different organisms um, across uh, samples collected out of the, out of the ocean. Um, 1996, uh, you saw the uh, first FOC1 uh, ZFN programmable nuclease demonstration. So this was really starting to um, resemble the what we're doing in the modern, uh, is my mouse moving there? Sorry. This is really starting to resemble what we're doing now, um, where we want programmability and predictability in the, in the cut of where we're going to uh, precisely edit a genome. Uh, then in 2002, the uh, uh, first in vivo demonstration of that technology was shown uh, again by the uh, Chandra Sagaran lab. Um, 2008 is actually, uh, um, many people don't know, the. this is where we start to get into the more uh, CRISPR-centric history. So in 2008, um, people showed that you could reprogram type 1 CRISPR systems to uh, block phage infection, and also that uh, CRISPR actually targets DNA as its, as its substrate. 
Um, so that began a lot of the, the frenzy to, to tr try to develop these nucleases because people had already seen the Falkland ZFN, but we're already starting to also understand that you could reprogram these things with much shorter sequences, which was really the, the key innovation of, of the CRISPR uh, nuclease technology. Um, around 2010, I put this in here because there was so, so much hard work that went into developing tailings uh, for large-scale uh, uh, genome editing, and then they, they quickly sort of gotten forgotten because of the, the CRISPR nuclease uh, systems. But 2010, there was a, uh, 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 they showed that you could repurpose tailings for nucleases and actually develop some pretty large libraries that I think are still commercially available. 2012 is when uh, the Doudna Lab first uh, demonstrated the full reconstitution of the Cas9 system in vitro. And that, uh, again, gave people now the working parts to go into cells and think about doing uh, a, a much easier reprogramming system than any of the Talon or Zinc finger work had, had offered uh, to be able to do a high throughput uh, genome editing. Um, in 2013, uh, uh, that, uh, the first demonstrations were shown in eukaryotes out of the Zhang, uh, Marafini, and Church groups. Um, and then in 2014, there were some CRISPR knockout libraries uh, uh, published out of the Zhang and Lander groups. And this is kind of where we came into the, the fold of, of CRISPR. So I started in Ryan's lab around 2012. Um, and uh, <clears throat> we, had, we had just seen the, the uh, Doudna Labs publications uh, that had just come online. And we were starting, I was starting to think actually about, you know, how to port that stuff over into, into the kinds of applications that uh, Ryan wanted to develop in his lab. Um, <clears throat> so we, uh, we began working on, oh, let's see, there it is. We began working on uh, the um, CRISPR systems uh, in early 2013. By 2014, we had uh, filed applications that were describing early uh, versions of the CREATE technology and how to scale the, the CRISPR system for uh, uh, precision editing. Uh, in 2015 is when we uh, uh, founded the company and began our mission to democratize this for the rest of the public. Um, 2016 is uh, when the, the publication actually came out to uh, describe all of this for the, for the broader community. And I think the, the main thing to point out here is that, again, the state of CRISPR when we inherited it was that it was really good. You could reprogram and do one edit at one site pretty well, but the, the systems just weren't uh, in place to make this a scalable technology in the same way you had, uh, they had demonstrated with some of the DNA shuffling or error-prone PCR systems up here in the, the non-nuclease domains. So that's, that's great, Andrew. Just one second before you move on. So you, you highlighted the, uh, the zinc fingers, the, the ZFNs and the, and the talons. Um, and you mentioned the, the, the biggest inhibitor for those taken off was the length of the, uh, of the DNA that was needed to use them, but what other, what else prevented um, zinc fingers and talons from taking off, do you think? Um, I, so I think they're still very specific. Um, they're, they're really good for some things. I think the problem was being able to build them rapidly and prototype new ones. So you had to do a whole, um, you had to basically synthesize and, and uh, piece together uh, repetitive DNA elements to then build full um, tail or zinc finger proteins. And that becomes uh, a fundamental challenge uh, at the level of, you know, just taking synthetic DNA and piecing it together, um, especially for repetitive regions. So there was a lot of good publications describing how to do that. But again, the, those, uh, you know, those approaches all suffer from uh, the inability to scale real, uh, quickly because you have to piece so many parts together to build each new tail or zinc finger. And yeah. what about the, uh, what about the licensing of those two technologies? How did that impact the, uh, the spread of them? Of tail and, and zinc fingers? Yeah. You know, I, I, I don't know much about that story cause I, yeah, I, I haven't uh, invested there, but. <laughs> well, spe specifically where I was, where I was leading was that I've heard from many people that the, that part of the, fact that it didn't spread was the was the restrictive or expensive licensing option so i think it's related to what you're going to talk about 
uh, shortly in terms of the uh, the mad zymes that that you're going to come on to later. So we can come back to yeah, that later. I, I am going to address that, and I, I would believe that. Yeah, I think there is there is a, a desire to control the tools that we've seen in the CRISPR space. So. Great. Okay, back to you. All right. So so moving forward. Um, so. I just kind of wanted to dig in and show you uh, a couple examples of what was published uh, to, to start to shed light on what these CRISPR systems are doing. So there was some great work out of uh, a, a group in Europe that uh, up here on the top that um, really they were working with CRISPR systems that were already native to E. coli. Uh, there, were, there are many, many types of these uh, systems and there, there's one encoded in the E. coli genome. So they started there. Uh, demonstrating that um, basically they could take uh, you know different components let's see if I can get my mouse back on so different components of either in this system they had the cascade uh, which does the the RNA processing or Cas3 which is just the nuclease uh, and these expressed alone have no activity but when you have them combined with uh, down here the uh, the appropriate strand of guide RNA synthesized then you get complete uh, blocking of, of the lambda phage infection process. So this was some of the first evidence people uh, saw that, hey, these systems, A, can be reprogrammed, uh, and B, that they're potentially targeting something about the nucleic acids. There was still some question as to whether it was an RNA targeting mechanism or a DNA targeting mechanism. And in fact, there are different uh, CRISPR systems that are RNA specific or DNA uh, specific as we now know. Um, but one of the other big breakthroughs at the time was that uh, the uh, Marfini uh, and Sondheimer uh, did some really nice work to show that they could block plasmid infection here. So this is uh, when they have arrays targeting their plasmid, uh, they, they get zero, you know, zero colony formation uh, post transformation here. Um, whereas if they if they scramble the plasmid, um, they get a good transformation uh, uh, from that DNA molecule. And they also did some really nice uh, studies to show that a splicing RNA, uh, if they targeted the, the element that gets spliced out, um, they should knock out the RNA, and that, that didn't happen. So they were able to piece together that this was definitely targeting the DNA uh, molecule in the cell. So those were those were big milestones, and actually, there were patent filings from from this group out of Northwestern uh, on the bottom here that uh, you know ended up actually getting abandoned in the uh, by the tech transfer office there um, that that led that kind of opened the door for all of the the um, Berkeley uh, Broad debate that you now uh, see going on. Great. Um, Andrew, I want to just uh, do a time check. We've got about 30 minutes left, and I want to make sure we've got uh, time at the end for Q&A. So just to make sure you yeah. can, uh, you can keep yeah, the we'll pace. Yeah, we'll kind of hop through. Yeah, so yeah. And I, I want to get on, yeah, I want to get on to the create chemistry and the exciting, uh, yeah. uh, the exciting instrument. Uh, but also just a reminder, this is live. So if anybody has any questions along the way, please type them into the box and, uh, and we'll answer them. Thanks for that, John. All right. So, yeah. Um, Okay, back on the slides. So again, uh, people have been doing in the background uh, a lot of uh, phylogenetic uh, work to understand what different CRISPR systems were out there. Uh, the story, as you know, is that um, people identified uh, uh, effector molecules that uh, encoded all the properties you needed for RNA processing and DNA cleavage in a single polypeptide. So all the work that had been done in these class one systems quickly uh, you know, gave way to people focusing on things they could more easily engineer and repurpose, uh, which led to the class two systems of Cas9 and CPF1. Um, these were the, this is sort of some of the landmark data uh, reducing the Cas9 system to practice, which happened in 2012. And um, again, uh, just a, a, you know, uh, some of the first uh, data that you could knock a gene out uh, using NHEJ-based repair uh, 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 following a cut, or uh, knock a gene in here with GFP getting knocked into an allele uh, in human cell lines. So again, that's where we started. Um, and, and we also had some data uh, supporting how you would do uh, uh, you know, precision editing where people were basically doing co-delivery of a 
guide RNA and an oligo in this format or uh, a, a guide RNA and a, a clone um, uh, HDR library in this format. And uh, people were seeing high efficiency at a single locus, which is what uh, was done in both of these studies. This one out of the Marafini lab, this one out of the Shinduri lab. Um, but uh, in both cases, again, you were limited to being able to only really study a couple mutations at a time. And this was called out uh, in both, uh, really in this study uh, from the Shinduri lab, uh, it was uh, highlighted that there was a, a lot of work that needed to go into scaling this up uh, in this um, composition. So getting to create, um, we, we realized that, I mean, a lot of that came from the, uh, a poor scalability issue. So in all the co-transformation issues that were the sort of editing dogma, um, people were using single-stranded DNA uh, repair systems, which uh, uh, scale poorly mainly because of the probability of co-transformation. So if you have a random uh, cell that's received a random guide RNA uh, that's uh, now it needs to receive the correct donor uh, repair uh, template that scales as approximately one over n, where n is the library size. So, for a thousand member library, you have a one in a thousand chance of getting a cell receiving the right pair of guide RNA donor. And this is, uh, you know, really the the basis for how we uh, thought about developing Create. So, Create was really around uh, understanding that we needed to create a covalently linked HR donor and guide RNA construct uh, to be able to deliver precision editing tools uh, to every single cell in our population and get this to scale uh, for library generation. Um, what, was, what was done here is uh, you can see that our constructs encoded basically a guide RNA function and, and a homology arm function on the same oligo, and we could print these uh, in microarray fashion at hundreds of thousands at a time. So the way that the create technology basically works is we would, uh, for a given uh, library design, print these these oligos, clone them in parallel, transform them into cells, and get uh, you know each cell type to have a different edit. Where we have now hundreds or you know tens to hundreds of thousands of different cell types that we've created in a single transformation. Um, then we can treat these cells either through screening or selection. Um, at the time, we started with selection as a much better or easier tool to employ for for the uh, back end. Um, and then you can uh, track the the um, abundance of each genotype in your population by sequencing the the uh, resulting plasmid population. So that's where the trans barcode concept for us came from, where the plasmid was encoding both the HR donor and the edit and telling us uh, all the information we needed to know about which amino acid changes we'd made at the genome scale, um, which was very exciting because you know now you're talking about a protein engineering tool that scales the whole genomes. So we uh, we then um, in the in the early work uh, we set about uh, trying to show that that this truly did scale up. So we showed saturation mutagenesis. Uh, type applications like what uh, protein engineers would be uh, familiar with where you can do, uh, th you know, here we did over 3,000 mutations in a single transformation and we challenged the, the uh, DHFR or dihydrofolate reductase gene, uh, which is a target for trimethoprim uh, antibiotic resistance. So we uh, mutagenized the protein, exposed it to TMP, and and then uh, did the, the plasmid sequencing on the back end to understand what protein variants were really the, the key winners in this selective pressure. Um, we, in one, one uh, or well, a couple uh, replicates of this study, we reproduced over 30 years of adaptive evolution data um, and saw many of the hits that other people had described in the ad um, adaptive, the AL adaptive laboratory evolution uh, literature. Um, we also identified uh, a couple really interesting uh, novel mutations that um, people had always reported combinatorial sets of mutations that could get you to high TMP resistance. And we saw a couple of single amino acid changes that got you, um, as you can see here, this F153R resistance into the near um, you know, milligram per mil 
levels of antibiotics. So this is an extremely potent uh, resistance mutation we found in, in our first uh, application of the technology to this gene. Andrew, so just to be clear what's going on there, your um, traditional protein engineering might take an enzyme and you want to increase its uh, efficiency or yield um, and you would maybe do one or two changes or you know, tens of changes um, by, by picking an error of the enzyme that you, that you want to change. Uh, you make all these changes, it would take a long time to do them and then you'd screen them. And what you did in a single reaction here was do 3,000 changes at a time, create 3,000 3, different changes, very focused on the particular area that you wanted, and then you were able to screen for efficiency on, on a much higher throughput than uh, on, in terms of the edit space than anybody's been able to do before. Is that correct? Yeah, that's exactly it. So this is kind of falls into the deep scanning mutagenesis uh, theme that people are really try, you know, trying to go after to understand uh, everything from antibiotic resistance to disease phenotypes that we uh, currently sequence basically in, in natural populations and try to reconstruct. Here we can you know, forward construct it and understand the full you know, phenotypic landscape in a much more rapid uh, uh, time cycle. Got it. And we have a question that's come in from Shamila Bankia. And Shamila asks, is this system compatible with CRISPR or just Madzyme? And you're going to talk about Madzyme in a second, but uh, may maybe if you can just take that question. I mean, I, I will say that uh, just to back up here, we did this initial work with Cas9. We now, the, the, cre the create technology is portable to uh, a variety of nucleases. And that's you know, something, you know, We've, we've leveraged uh, to use it with Madzymes, but yeah, this was all done with Cas9. Got it, okay. So, um, uh, okay, another case study. So we, uh, we had um, been looking at some of the adaptive evolution experimentation that was going on. There's some really elegant studies out of uh, a, a, a French group, the uh, uh, lead author, Tenayon, that was published in uh, 2012, where they had done a year of continuous culture under 42 degree, uh, um, so high temperature growth selection with a with a non uh, ideal carbon source, and they they ran 115 of these selections in parallel. So you can imagine a lot of uh, you know work in the lab to get this all operating and running for that whole time, um, and then they full genome sequenced uh, each of the they took. Uh, one isolate from each of those selection uh, uh, processes and sequenced it uh, to 90x coverage whole genome uh, and identified point mutations that had aggregated across the genome for this uh, particular uh, adaptive evolution. Uh, what was interesting is that we, we decided, well, let's see if you know we can basically validate their study and also think about other ways to do this where we speed up the evolutionary process by orders of magnitude. So we took that. Um, many of those mutations, so we started with just looking at the point mutations were in the coding sequences. That was easier to code for us initially. Um, and we also tested all the other library designs we had made in this particular study. But we had 645 of the AL derived set um, that went into an experiment. And we used the other ones as sort of our control set. Uh, we ran, uh, you know, fairly short uh, uh, growth uh, adaptations to avoid any kind of uh, adaptive evolution that wasn't coming from our system, uh, and then we we uh, isolated the, the the cells and looked at which plasmids had had uh, enriched in the population. And sure enough, um, as you can see, kind of down here, this red uh, distribution. It, this is the number of cassettes we were actually able to retrieve out of the selection, 405 of the 6, uh, 645, and the vast majority of those were actually enriched um, uh, compared to the the synonymous set uh, shown here in, in dark uh, black. So this was a nice validation that, um, in fact, you know, we, we could recover and replicate that data and also speed up the entire process and shrink it down to a much more manageable sequencing run on the back end. All that was collected with part of a, uh, uh, a MySeq run. And Andrew, we have a question from Vishal, and you can take it now, you can take it later, but what kind of software tools do you use? Um, all this uh, uh, design and, and analysis was actually done uh, with uh, custom Python code. So, um, yeah, so we, we 
uh, basically I had to code up a lot of that um, and we're now, and Script is actually developing a full suite of software that's going to make that available for even non-expert, you know, coders to be able to go in and do all of the, both the front end and back end design and analysis. So, but at this point it was all uh, custom Python. Got it. Okay. And, uh, and in the, maybe you can address software when we talk about uh, what's going to be coming down the pipeline uh, when you launch the, uh, the new machine. Yeah. Um, yeah, we will, I'm going to try to speed through this part and get to that. So, um, yeah, this is just one, one more example. Um, I to not beat a dead horse. I'll just quickly say that, um, we, we challenged some of these libraries with, uh, uh, antibiotics as a selection agent and we're able to quickly map, uh, you know, active sites. So, you know, this was sort of, um, you know, a nice validation that even drug binding sites were now at the resolution where we can see which residues are affecting drug binding across the whole genome survey. So this is really the, you know, holy grail of where we're trying to go uh, with creating a functional uh, genomic tool here. So, um, and then we, we've seen uh, further validation for our approach uh, actually has come from a number of different follow-on studies that have uh, publish very similar kinds of technology. There's different brand names for each one, but they're they're effectively the same. Uh, the core concept applied to uh, yeast. Um, there's a few uh, additional uh, you know features in some of these, but I encourage people to to look at these papers and and do the cross comparison, and you'll see that um, this is I think uh, you know evidence that the the technology itself is going to gain a lot of traction. This is from labs all over the country. So. Great. Excellent. Okay. So again, uh, to sort of reemphasize, when we when we started with nucleases, this was kind of the the um, state of the art where you could go to uh, either a few uh, genomic locations and a small variety of edit types to do gene knockout or gene knock-in for precision type editing. Um, you could do genome-wide knockout. Uh, people had done some guide RNA screens where you're doing genome-wide knockout but you're getting, again, low variety of edit types. And um, the non-nuclease uh, world had sort of uh, been, been focused on few, uh, lots of edit type diversity, but few number of loci because it's just hard to scale all that build. And where uh, Inscriptor really is differentiated is that we allow uh, both the high diversity of edit type and number of uh, genomic locations uh, in ways that haven't been possible before for both genome engineering and genome discovery. So this is this is where we uh, believe we're most differentiated from other tools that have been out there for for you know decades now. Um, and and we believe that by enabling unprecedented scale, superior performance, and greater access, that people are going to be able to take advantage of this to run you know, really sophisticated uh, um, engineering. Uh, um, efforts that they weren't uh, in power to do before, so. Great, excellent. Okay, so getting into more of the, the democratization part of this, one of the things that we sort of realized early on is that, um, you know, it was gonna be difficult to, to, you know, get customers interested in working with us uh, if, we, if we couldn't provide them all, all parts of the tool suite they needed to perform the, the, the editing, so. We set to work doing a, a you know, uh, the kind of bioprospecting that's been done traditionally to find uh, novel enzyme variants for a wide variety of applications, and we and we did that for this uh, for the CRISPR space, uh, which is where we we found MAD7, which uh, we we received recognition in the scientists last year for as a top ten innovation, and really this was about um, us, you know, providing our customers uh, better licensing terms. Uh, and, and, you know, broader access to being able to do uh, CRISPR-based genome editing uh, within the context of our platform. Um, so we characterized the enzyme. This is some early stuff we put out in some of the white papers. You can, you can go download from our website uh, where we're looking at uh, PAM preference and uh, the ability to edit uh, across a number of different uh, genomic loci. We've also had some, a, a lot of different people reach out to us and, and get involved in helping to develop uh, the enzyme for other applications. So we've seen uh, data come back from 
uh, Horizon. They, they, uh, we had some partnerships going with them where they took it into uh, mammalian cell cell lines and tested for, uh, in this case, just gene disruption activity, and they saw really good performance relative to uh, even uh, you know Cas9 and some of the the enzymes that have been worked on for already uh, you know almost a half a decade. So we were pretty excited to that we had found such a uh, high efficiency enzyme uh, and that we could you know translate into our platform. Great. Um, and and we get this question a lot. So yeah, we you know there are there is some identity to the other CPF ones, but it's a very low percentage. Um, this is this is one of the ways in which we you know prioritize the way we would do the uh, bioprospecting was to look for distant homologs that are, or distant orthologs that we could uh, you know um, uh, use in our uh, in our uh, platform. Great, excellent. So, um, so yeah, here at Inscripta, we've we've got a lot of really talented engineers and scientists on staff um, who are you know helping to really broaden. So I, I uh, showed you some of the data where we really focused on the edit types where we we're uh, diversifying the the CDS um, and doing amino acid swaps. But we're we're now building the tool out to be able to do ribosome binding site, or uh, promoter engineering, terminator engineering, all the different sort of genetic parts that you want, and expanding the sort of uh, edit grammar that can be deployed on our system. This is a this is an ed, uh, uh, map of what we did uh, in designing a, a, a library for a, a lysine biosynthesis campaign, where. Uh, the ones in blue are all genome not uh, genome knockouts. The ones in green are all uh, promoter engineered variants, where we did in both of those libraries every gene across the E. coli genome. And then the black are stacked up uh, a little higher here because those are saturation mutagenesis uh, within the coding sequences of these genes. So uh, to prove that we can do all that, we've been doing a lot of development work here at Inscripta. To get all of the system components working at, you know, high reproduci uh, re reproducibility and robustness. So, here you're seeing, uh, you know, genomic reads where we're looking at a promoter insertion going in. Uh, this is a triple stop, uh, TA, uh, triple stop codon library going into the uh, in frame in a gene, and here's some saturation mutagenesis. All of these uh, kinds of validations we're doing both at single locus and whole genome scale currently uh, to vet the technology and make sure it's working um, as expected for our customers. Uh, Andrew, uh, we have a, a question that's coming from Shamila again. Um, how does Madzyme compare um, against Zinc Fingers, uh, Talons, and Cas9? Uh, so I, I don't think it's worth making much of a comparison to the Talon or Zinc Fingers um, just because there's uh, we're, we're not re-engineering the protein each time. So these still are RNA-guided nuclease systems uh, for the Madzymes. So it's um, uh, comparable to the kind of activity you, we've seen with Cas9 in the past uh, in terms of both the number of sites we, have, we seem to be able to edit and uh, you know, basically how robust the enzyme is and how we re reprogram it. Got it. Yep. So, um, so yeah, so we've taken the, the approach of, uh, you know, what we did with CREATE and all of the, the new uh, feature updates that we've made here at Inscripta, and we've run the sort of directed evolution playbook the way that um, traditional enzyme engineering companies would, uh, but this, this time at genome scale and across, you know, uh, the whole pathway for a large number of edit types, this is sort of a summation of, of that work. Um, where this was run by uh, a couple of really talented scientists at, at uh, uh, Inscripta, Dan Held and Eric Abate, um, and the data, data collection was done on Agilent Rapid Fire to do direct lysine tests, um, and that was all set up by a, a gentleman named Mike, Michael Clay, who is a, a great uh, member of our application development group, um, and these guys uh, basically ran an 18,000 member library screen and identified all sorts of uh, improved variants from 
from their first pass running through this, um, really validating that the tool we built is now working with the efficiencies that we want to be able to deliver for even the screening customers, um, where we're, we're uh, you know, delivering a lot of mutations with every round of, of uh, running the instrument. Um, this whole process, again, was sort of rational in that we looked at the proteins, we looked at the pathways and all the, the things we wanted to target, and we did genome-wide search. All of this uh, tallied up to 200,000 edits that were designed. Of course, 18,000 were tested, um, and, and it turns out you don't need to necessarily saturate your, your testing to get to really good uh, solutions for next rounds of directed evolution, which we're now uh, doing some of that as part of uh, follow-on uh, proof of concept to show our customers just how to teach them how to use these technologies to get you know large-scale direct evolution uh, processes, processes up and running. Um, <clears throat> we're also uh, kind of hard at work uh, thinking about the the challenges of precision editing. This is a big field. A lot of people are working on it. Um, and in both eukaryotic and bacterial systems, um, there are uh, the preferred route for repair actually tends to be for eukaryotes, uh, NHEJ, which is non-homologous end joining. Uh, this, this basically often results in deletion, insertion, or re-ligation uh, to form wild type uh, um, sequences. These are sort of error prone repair pathways that we don't really want cells to use. Um, so we think a lot about uh, what, how to promote better HDR or homolog uh, homology directed repair. Um, where uh, we want we want to you know promote the right players to come in and and uh, you know uh, do the homology directed repair off of a donor template, which is really how our technology works is uh, de uh, delivering that donor template with the guide and and forming those precision edits. Um, in bacteria, um, you know same problem except for that there is no NHEJ, so a lot of them just die. So we've We've done a lot of work in the background to really optimize these systems so that you don't get large amounts of, uh, you know, the, these set up situations where cells want to escape uh, and do something you don't want them to. So we're, you know, uh, refining all of that so our customers don't have to. Um, and, you know, with the end goal being able to d uh, deliver these precision editing products. So. This is uh, sort of how we engineer the overall workflow uh, for our customers. So the, they'll um, basically, from our device, uh, you know, be able to do push button type of, uh, you know, um, operations in an instrument that I'm not showing here because we'll be actually showing, uh, stepping into light with that at uh, Symbio Beta in a couple months. But uh, the, uh, the, device will actually de uh, deliver the edited cell population, which the, can then go into pooled or isolated screening uh, 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 workflows um, that can be, you can do direct detection or uh, different sequencing applications on the back end. This gives you all the genotype and phenotype information you need to feed the next cycle of directed evolution, which goes back into our design and instrumentation process, uh, sort of not pictured here upstream. Um, so, so Andrew, everything that you've described so far in terms of high throughput editing, um, and you described a $200,000 edit library, um, is going to be wrapped up inside a sexy looking device that's going to sit on the lab bench. You put in your, your cells, you programmed it on the computer, what you want to do, you hit a button and just like a bread maker, off it goes. Uh, how, how long is it, would a typical uh, library take to create? Yeah, so I think you know the doing this like the old-fashioned way. It's hard to it's hard to estimate exactly. I don't know if you you even can, but because uh, there isn't really an old-fashioned way to do it. Um, but uh, you know the way that we envision this is this is really like you know a couple weeks timeline that goes through each cycle. Um, you know I think some of the longest parts will be um, deciding what you want to engineer and what you know you want to include in your diversity generation. Um, and we are really, you know, wanting to get people's feedback and, and help them build. Uh, we're working with some really great early access partners 
who have great ideas about what to do with that. So, um, but but a, a typical run on the instrument uh, itself will probably only take uh, about 30 hours for E. coli, and it will be uh, somewhat dependent on cell type. So the number of cell doublings uh, is part of you know the workflow, and and it'll be a little longer for yeast. So you're you're looking at an end to end, you know, a design, build, and test build itself being the 30 hour chunk, and then the design and test and and uh, analysis being sort of the longer chunks. Um, that all will be assisted by our software, and like I said, this could uh, operate on the sort of weeks time scale to get you through each round of directed evolution very quickly. Got it. And uh, Edgardo has a good question. Uh, which many people may be thinking, which is how do you then decide which of the 200,000 you're going to test? Well, so we are going to have tiered kit offerings where you can start at 1,000, you can do 10,000. So I think, you know, we're, we're challenging people to think big, which I'm going to go ahead and just leave this as the screen while we're talking here. Sure. Um, you know, what, what would you do with 2,000 edits, I think, is a, a great uh, question, to challenge question for people to think about. Um, but I think, you know, you don't necessarily have to go to that scale to get really interesting biological discovery done. So, you know, we, we're, uh, the E. coli genome is 4,000 roughly uh, genes. So we can do, you know, we can do focused uh, types of, you know, like the promoter libraries I was talking about earlier in the lysine pathway. Um, you can do those sorts of modifications, sort of a genome scale with a relatively small number. Um, we, we just think that the, the larger that you go in the edit space, um, you're, you're kind of leaving no st stone unturned. And, you know, when you're doing a, a you know, directed evolution campaign, you really want to make sure you're bringing in all of the diversity, beneficial diversity from uh, the, across the genome into every round. We think that's what's going to make strain engineering a much, you know, uh, more routine science in the future. So. Got it. Um, and can you address a little bit of the, you know, breadth versus depth? Uh, what what should you be thinking about when you're when you're designing your experiment? Um, uh, yeah, I, I'd say you know that's somewhat going to be, I think, you know, dependent on what the customer's interests are. Um, you know, I think for a protein engineer, it's probably going to be more the depth question: how deep can you to go across one, you know, one sort of uh, gene? For, for a sort, sort of a pathway or network modeling lab who might want to actually you know, take some of their, their models and test them in an experimental system, you're, you're probably looking more at you know, sort of the breadth question and then going through that in combinatorial depth as you, as you build up uh, you know, combinatorial libraries. Um, so I think, that, again, the answer is going to vary, and we're, we're really interested in partnering with our customers and understanding their problems and helping them, you know, address those, those questions in the right ways. And we have some really great people on staff to help, you know, guide those discussions. So. Got it. And this is, you know, really part of the innovation that enables you to do the true multiplexing genome engineering. Um, so, I, I, you know, I think it's a, it's a key part of that. When you're thinking about... Um, teaching people how to use this uh, piece of equipment, but also how to think about designing their experiments. What are some of the educational challenges that you think you'll have to come across? Because people are not used to doing 200,000 edits at a time. So how are you going to, how, how are you going to help educate people? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I mean, I think, you know, we want to build trust that it a, is, is something they can do. And then, you know, I think we are faced with the challenge where, you know, um, you know, we don't want to be, uh, you know, um, using the technology and competing with customers. We want to train them how to do this and let them explore their ideas. So, um, you know, I think that's still an open question, how, how you get people to sort of buy into that larger scale, uh, you know, operation. I think a lot of it will come from just how economical it's going to be for them to do, uh, you know, to run direct evolution using tools like this and how good the data uh, you know, how reproducible and, and reliable the data is going to be um, because a lot of, you know, adaptive evolution and uh, directed evolution studies really suffer from, you know, they're, they're, you get sort of different answers every time you do it. And I think we're building a really robust system here. Um, we've brought in leadership from the NGS world and uh, the diagnostics world, people who've built really robust, uh, you know, assays for, 
you know, in other in other fields that are they're bringing that expertise to directed evolution now. So that's what Inscripta is going to be able to deliver. Great. Uh, we are almost at time, but we have time for a couple more questions. So if you do have any last questions, please type them into the Q and A box. Um, I wanted to remind people that if you want to see this in action, it's going to be launched at Symbio Beta in October. There's also going to be a workshop at Symbio Beta. So if you want to get hands-on experience, seeing how it's going to work, then you can come to the workshop. And if you're, if you haven't signed up for Symbio Beta yet, then you can use the discount code Inscriptor to receive $200 off of your registration fee, but you've got to do it before noon this Friday. So we have one last question um, from Vishal and Vishal asks, are you using design of experiment, DOE, to couple the two cycles? And um, which two cycles is Vishal referring to, Andrew, do you know? Um, I think he may be talking about um, how, to, how to iterate. So design of experiment in the next iteration, I'm not, I'm not totally sure, but I mean, we, so we have, I sort of alluded to it uh, early in the talk, we have people like Richard Fox on staff who, um, you know, are interested in building those functionalities even into our, our designer upfront software. Um, that won't be necessarily part of the first uh, launch, but, you know, as, as we build a customer base, I think, you know, how you plug in data from each experiment and choose which things to recombine in your next experiment, he's a, he's a, uh, seasoned veteran in, in that and we're you know going to leverage the expertise we have here to build those capabilities for other people got it so. great um, and uh, so we have a couple of questions from kevin clancy that i hadn't noticed uh he says any thoughts on how this might work on chloroplasts or mitochondria and um kevin also asked do you have a set of equipment you would recommend for a robust workflow that one would need to use with your instrument um, that's a great, so I think we, we do sort of have a framework of what equipment pairs nicely with this, uh, just from some of the work we've been doing internally. I'd say that's a, that's a more detailed answer. We probably would want to, uh, you know, talk to him directly offline. Um, but, uh, as far as delivery to chloroplasts and, and I think the hard part there is, you know, really probably around how you localize and ensure, you know, the activity is restricted to, uh, you know, uh, the, the compartments of the cell you want. So uh, a lot of the work we do is mostly nu uh, nucleus centric, uh, but that's a great question. I have, I've not really heard that one yet. So Great. And uh, Kevin, if you want to follow up, just drop me an email. I can connect you to Andrew. Well, um, excellent. And uh, just finally, you had talked about uh, the, the business model for Inscript. It isn't that you're going to use your own this machine to create your own commercial applications. You're a, two, you're a true tools platform company. So you're kind of modeling, I would guess on a company like Illumina, they're, in the, they're on the, uh, the reading of DNA, you've got Twist and other companies on the writing of DNA, and uh, Inscript is gonna be the, uh, the, uh, the editing or the genome engineering company as your, uh, as your slogan says. So what, why is, how did you come to that decision not to go after your own products, to, but to become a tools company? And why is that important for you and for your customers as well? Yeah, I think the culture at Inscripta is really that to build a good tool, you need to focus on building the tool. Um, and, you know, I think that, you know, we believe that there's a lot of creativity in the scientific community and people will pick this up and do things that not even we would think of um, and expand it in ways that they have for the NGS platforms and, you know, create new functionalities that, you know, will we'll expand what the platform can do. We, we you know, just uh, see it as our, our mission, our job to get them the best, you know, best in-class tools. So, yeah. Great. Um, and uh, any plans for the future? What do you think uh, will be coming down the line in future product releases? Well, we talked a little bit about, uh, you know, uh, select mammalian cell lines. Um, so we'll probably, I don't know the timeline yet for when we'll be, you know, uh, revealing more of that to the public, but uh, that's, a, that's a big push for us. Um, also, how you do, uh, so we, we will be doing kits that uh, get at combinatorial editing. Um, those will be sort of rolled out um, after first customer ship. So first customer ship will be, more of the single added diversity generation uh, kits to get people you know, integrated and started. And the combinatorial kits will be a follow on to that, uh, that, that expand the capabilities to more of the, the directed evolution paradigm. 
great, excellent. And I know you're going to be starting to take orders um, coming to Symbio Beta. So um, we encourage as many people to come as possible, see the launch, see what's, uh, what's coming down the pipeline, and uh, you'll get to meet the whole Inscriptor team uh, at Symbio Beta in October. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for giving us a, uh, a peek inside uh, of Inscriptor and what's to come. Uh, it's a very exciting company, very exciting technology. And uh, in, in terms of why we are passionate about synthetic biology and making synthetic biology easier to engineer, um, I think Inscripta is, uh, is about to come out with something revolutionary that's really going to drive home uh, what we care about and how we can make biology easier to engineer. So thanks for co-founding the company. Thanks for coming on to talk to us about it. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in person in October as well. Great. Thanks, John. Thanks for having Great. me. Great. Thank you. Have a good one. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thank you.